Welcome to the Financial Planning for Canadian Business Owners podcast. You will hear about industry insights with award-winning financial planner and entrepreneur, Jason Pereira. Through the interviews with different experts with their stories and advice, you will learn how you can navigate the challenges of being an entrepreneur, plan for success, and make the most of your business and life. And now, your host, Jason Pereira. Hello, welcome to Financial Planning for Canadian Business Owners. Today I show you my colleague Guy Anderson again, although this time instead of him interviewing me, I am interviewing him specifically on the topic of planning for disabilities for business owners. Now, we're not going to dive too deep into disability insurance. I have someone else coming on the show to talk about that. But specifically this time, what we're going to do is talk about how business owners can plan for their family members who have disabilities, how they can plan for their employees uh, who might become disabled, and how they can also plan for what to do if they become disabled themselves. And with that, here's my interview with Guy. Hello, Guy. Morning, Jason. Thanks for taking the time again. Anytime. Good. So, Guy, brought you back on. You have kind of, not that it's your full niche uh, of dealing with people with disabilities, but you've done a bunch of advocacy work and work in regards to people with disabilities. So that's why I brought you on in particular to talk about this subject. So I think a good place to start with all this is let's start with talking about government programs that help and enable people on disability. And then we can talk about the implications of that for business owners who maybe have disabled children or family members that they need to take care of, employees, and then themselves. So let's just start off by looking at what is someone entitled to in this country when they are disabled? Well, that's a, that's actually a, an interesting question because province by province, there's, there's different programs. But if you look at it from a multi-jurisdictional or, or mandate perspective, there's all sorts of different plans that are available. So mm-hmm. first of all, a lot of business owners would probably be fully aware that they they may have to register with the WSIB, so the Workplace Safety and Insurance, Insurance Board. Board. Right. Yeah. So, and generally, that's the you know, construction industry or or restaurants, etc. But the website's actually really quite uh, quite impressive. Where so, if someone is not sure if they qualify or have to register with them, there's a very simple drop down box, and they can they can figure that out. But anyone who's starting a business should actually go there because they have to register with WSIB within ten days. So that's that's one. Well, assuming thing. That they're in an industry where that's required, right? Not every industry is required to do so. Well, exactly. So I mean, but the drop down box is as I was uh, alluding to gives you a clear indication as to whether your industry is required to work with the WSIB in the first place. So, so it's really quite yeah. helpful. So anyone that's starting a business should first and foremost go there to see if they have to register. But it's pretty common sense. So and let's then, talk about what that covers, though. So what does WSIB do for business owners and employees? Well, it takes a lot of the risk off the business owner themselves because if someone is is injured on the job, the employee first files, I believe it's a, a form six or a form eight, and WSIB takes care of the the disability claims, et cetera. So and WSIB is is generally for those industries that have high recurrences of injuries and, and, and illnesses. So it, it takes a lot of the risk off the, the business owner themselves. Further to that, looking at the federal level. Before also, we go, I just want to touch on one thing. I've often, there's been a couple of times where I've seen people try to come to me and say, you know what, you know, is there an alternative to this? Can I can I buy like a separate plan and not have to pay into this? Well, the answer first and foremost is no. If you're in an industry that has to be a part of WSIB, you absolutely have to pay into it. And secondly, WSIB does a number of things, including basically, yes, disability benefits for people become disabled. Now, it's not perfect because it only covers people while they're at work. So if an injury happens outside of work, they're not covered. However, the thing about WSIB that is different from any private plan is they will pay for workplace retraining. So you can't do your job anymore, but you can be retrained to do some other job. They'll pay for that. They'll pay for household modifications and putting in things like ramps and and whatnot, whereas normal disability policies will not. So anytime someone comes to me and, and asks that, I say, well, first of all, you don't have that option. Secondly, I don't think you would want that option if you could, because the coverage that you get from WSIB is incredibly robust. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point to make, actually, because you're absolutely right for the for the cost of it. And I think it's around a dollar twenty per hundred dollars of of, uh, of salary. You actually get quite a bit for it. And a lot of people would, you know, they might poo poo on on certain government agencies, but WSIB has a place for sure. Yeah, I think um, it's because it's forced on people. A lot of people just don't love that concept. Exactly. Yeah. And then moving on provincially, you've got each province has got their own disability plan. Us being in Ontario, more familiar with the Ontario Disability Savings Plan uh, program, and that. The qualifications, they're not that hard to qualify. At the end of the day, ODSP covers a lot of people who generally just don't have a lot of, they have a disability, you've got a caseworker, and you're able to, you get about $1,000 a month, depending on the program that you qualify for. 
And then based on your assets and your income, so it is an asset, there is an asset test. It used to be 5,000 bucks. It's now, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's $40,000 now. So if you if you yeah, have- so It used to be you couldn't have any money in your account, basically. Now you can have the 40, I think it's 40,000. So yeah, and, and that, thankfully- and that, caused people, that caused a lot of people to basically um, you know, hide money or shift money around. It was really, really incredibly restrictive. And it caused a lot of grief where, where people who- honestly couldn't get by in life and then they they come into a little bit of money and then all of a sudden they're cut off ODSP. So but the rules have changed and and now they can have a few dollars in their bank accounts around forty thousand dollars and they can earn a little bit of money. But if you do qualify for the ODSP, you do get about a thousand dollars a month. And if you have dietary restrictions, et cetera, you can also you can also get a little bit more there too. And then moving on to the one that most people I think would would recognize is the disability tax credit at the Mm -hmm. federal level. And that's that's the big one because depending on the the stats you look at, you know, roughly about a third of Canadians would have a disability. And the disability doesn't have to be a physical, it can be mental. And well, and that's let's stop there for a second. So this is one of the big things that people often push back on when it comes to looking at disability insurance and other things is is that, well, you know, I'm in knowledge work, I'm doing whatever else, right? Like how, you know, I'm not, everybody seems to think it's only construction workers and people in factories who basically get get uh, disabled because they always assume disability is physical, right? And it can be, even if it's not work-related, like you could be skiing on the weekend, blow out your knee and that's disability, right? But the mental nervous side, I mean, depending on the claim statistics I've seen, that range is anywhere between a third to, to like 40% of all disability claims is a mental nervous disorder, right? I've even met people who worked in back office administration, who developed anxiety disorders around piles of paper, who just basically, even if at home, they saw more than two to three sheets of paper stacked up, they'd have to spread them out because it led them to near panic. So frankly, anxiety disorders, mental nervous disorders can happen to anybody. So uh, we always have to, I always tell people, you got to get out of the, the, the mindset that this is about getting physically hurt. It could be mentally hurt. And one, one last piece on that is that when you talk about the statistics or the probability of becoming disabled, most of the stats I've seen peg the number at somewhere around one, in, like you said, one in three, about a third of Canadians are disabled for any point in their, in their lives. But even if you're in knowledge work, that number drops to at best one in four. So we're still talking about a very significant probability. And before going any further, one other thing to say, let's, let's not forget the most valuable asset the average person has and the average business owner has is their ability to work. So you may think that your most valuable asset is your house or your business, and you may insure those, but if you're not insuring your ability to work, you present value anyone's income over their lifetime. We're talking about multiple millions of dollars, even at modest incomes. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It, it, if you look at someone that's 20 with a 40-year, 45-year work work life, even at YMPE, at the average industrial wage, yeah, you're absolutely right. It's going to be millions of dollars that they miss out on. Now, not everyone's going to get become disabled for the entirety of that. So there's a very high percentage uh, of those who would, uh, when they become disabled, they're you know they're disabled for at least three months. But even still, those who do become disabled, they're generally out of work for a couple of years quite often. And to your point about the um, doesn't have to be a physical injury, it could also be an illness, right? So if you if you had a chronic illness and, it, and you then qualified, you weren't able to fulfill the necessities of uh, daily daily living, then you can also you can definitely also qualify. So there's a lot of different reasons that someone could qualify. And, and absolutely, like you said, your biggest asset is your ability to earn income. And most people do insure their house and their car, et cetera, but unfortunately don't take enough um, responsibility in insuring themselves. So there's an old saying in insurance products, which is if you can't afford the insurance on whatever it is you're looking to cover, you can't afford what it is you're looking to cover, right? So you got to look at the total cost of ownership of anything, right? So when you look at buying a car, it's not just car payments and gas. It's also the insurance in the car. When you look at the house, it's not just cost of the mortgage. It's also the property taxes, the utilities, everything else, and the insurance, right? If you don't have that, you're not protecting your asset. And when you get pushback and people say, well, I can't afford disability insurance, it's like, well, you can't afford the cost of your lifestyle is the honest truth. Because if you can't afford to protect it, the most valuable thing you have, something's wrong. That's right. As as we're talking about, you know, disability for business owners, you imagine what would happen to your business if you became disabled, even for a mm-hmm. short period of time. What would happen to the, your business? Who would replace you? Who would uh, who could step in and run the business if you weren't able to? Or what would happen to your business if, if some key employees were were out of work and you you had to you know make do without them without them around? So coming back, we were talking about the disability tax disability credit. tax credit. Yeah, let's go back there. Right. And I think that's uh, that's worthwhile spending a little bit of time on just because it's, it is so important. You and I both know, and 
I don't know how many of your listeners would be aware, but the, the disability tax credit, the 2201 form, was revised just a couple of years ago. And, and I think you and I chatted that day because we were both excited at how much easier it was to, for someone to, to apply now. I think it's an incredible thing that they did. But just coming back on the qualifications, though, like if someone has, has restricted vis- vision, speaking, hearing, ability to walking, eliminating, feeding, or dressing themselves, you know, those are the six criteria ultimately to qualify for the disability tax credit. And you do have to be markedly disabled and and it has to be for a prolonged period. So it it should be, the CRA is ultimately determining that it should be, it has to be almost lifelong. But there is also a qualification there that if you don't meet any one of those individual criteria, like you're not, you're not, you wouldn't be considered disabled on any one of those six criteria. There is also an all-encompassing part now the cumulative effect of significant restrictions. So if, if any one of those or any two of those combined significantly restrict your ability to, to do daily functions, then you could also qualify. And to your point about the m- mental functions, you know, that's an important part that's in there as well. So let's talk about what that credit gets us. So what is that? So first off, before I should do that, I will say this much. While a third of Canadians qual- could qualify for this, very a far smaller percentage actually were filed for it. So as I always tell people who where there's a question of if they qualify, if they have a disability and they have a need for ongoing care. And I've seen kids with ADD get this. I've seen kids with di- adult children with diabetes get this. I yep. say, just apply. Worst case scenario, just apply. Now, as for the application process, this can be bittersweet because there is a lot of, amb- there's some ambiguity around this. And unfortunately, I found out through someone I know's Freedom of Information Act request that the people who basically process these claims, they have a minimum failure rate they have to hit. So... Unfortunately, bureaucracy gets in the way of some of these things. So I often say that if you have a legitimate disability, you get rejected the first time, do it again. And I've yeah. literally seen people who got almost identical forms, once rejected, one and the other time approved. So unfortunately, the process could be easier, could be more user-friendly. And frankly, we should not be nitpicking on people who have disabilities, but it seems like the administration bureaucracy wants to do that. No, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, it, it could definitely be easier. The process is much better, especially since they included uh, nurses who could fill out the form yeah. on your back. Like coming back to that. So there's a personal, you fill out your personal information on the form and then you submit it to your medical professional, either your your GP, your general practitioner, or a specialist who will fill that out in, in, in great detail. And then you submit it to CRA. The issue there so, is it's generally six to eight weeks before you get a result. And the point that you you identified, the fact that most people don't apply for it, that the hardest part about this is, is that those who have a disability often are the ones that don't get the advice and don't and don't realize that this is available. Yeah. So, and a lot so, of the government, like a lot of the places they would go for help, community associations, whatever, don't have training in this. So unfortunately, they don't really know where to turn or they're not being told where to turn for this. Now, let, let's talk about what the disability tax credit gets you. So you qualify for this. What does that get you? Right. So the main thing it gets you is, is the claim on your tax return. And that claim is a non-refundable tax credit, roughly about $8,400 a year. Well, that's, so, that's the credit. So let's be clear on what that actually equals in terms of real dollars. Because this is right. these are the games we play in Canada, right? So you hear $84,000 tax credit, people, $8,400 tax credit, people think, oh, I'm going to save $8,400 no. in taxes. That's right. not how it works. We right. have to apply that to the lowest federal marginal tax rate, which is 15%. So right. it's 15% of the 84, which equals roughly. Yeah, I've seen around 1,500 bucks a year. Is that about right? Yeah. Is that what you see? Like, yeah, yeah, somewhere between 1,000 and 1,500. Yeah. So it used to be 1,000. Now it's now it's definitely been increased. So yeah, so you hear 84. The reality is it's closer to 15, but it's still it's still good. The other thing that we're worth mentioning is that if you qualify retroactively because you filed this yeah. form late, I mean, I've seen people get 10 years worth of this tax credit reassessed to them. And, you know, they get checks of over 10 grand uh, just for following this form. Right. And this is one of the things that I think you and I both uh, identified when they first changed the form is, is that it used to be, correct me if I'm wrong, but it used to be that you filled out the form, you got you qualified, then you'd have to submit a T1 adjustment on your tax returns. Yep. Now the form, section three, there's one single box that says, do you want the CRA to reassess your returns? And just by ticking that box, and I can't think of an, a scenario where it would not be advantageous. I mean, there's no downside from it. That box tick should not be a tick. It should be like, would, do you want to opt out of this? And no one would ever tick the box. Like, it, you know, this is, that's a design that does not need to exist. It should just be automatic. You're absolutely right. But at the end of the day, and this is one of the, the, the key things I liked about this, is the fact that, yeah, you tick that box. If your practitioner 
filled out the form and you would have you would have qualified for the disability tax credit up to 10 years ago, they will reassess your tax returns for up to 10 years. So in, and for the, the average business owner, depending on how much money they've actually paid themselves a salary and how much they, yeah, I, I don't know the scenario there, but like you said, they could potentially get 15 grand or so back just by ticking that box. Fantastic. So, so disability tax credit, what else is on the table for these people? Right. So the other thing, the disability tax credit is a gateway form, the T2201 form. Once it's approved by CRA and you get the certificate, it also opens up the opportunity for someone to qualify for the RDSP, the Registered Disability Savings Plan. And as a planning geek, um, I actually have a ranking of my favorite plans and the RDSP is by far my favorite government. So it's an income tested benefit or two benefits, a grant and a bond. And if you put in $1,000 and you're in the higher income bracket, I believe it's about a $1,000 match. If you put in $1,500 and you're in the lower bracket, I believe it's about a $3,500 match. Um, so bottom line is, is that you're going to for a you're going to be in a situation where you get as much as you put in, if not more from the government to the tune of what are the $200,000 between the both of them max or something like that? No, it's seven. Sorry. No, you can contribute to back. Yeah. You can, yeah. So that's right. You can contribute 200 grand, but the max max, the maximum match is 70,000 for one and 50,000 for the other roughly. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, so it's, it's incredibly lucrative. I mean, you know, the better solution is hopefully you're not disabled. You never have to use this, but if you do, that is a good situation to be in. Yeah, and, and coming back to you know some of the reasons that people don't apply for the disability tax credit, you know, I've often seen that people have a they feel there's a stigma around it. But when you see the the advantages, I mean, the, the disability tax credit in itself that that credit is designed to help those with disabilities cover the cost of the expenses that they might incur because of their disability, whether it's a wheelchair or medical costs, etc. So I mean that that credit is designed for for that purpose. But if someone also has does qualify for the disability tax credit and they look at the RDSP and the advantages uh, that it offers, I mean, there's, there's just no better way to, to grow money for someone with a disability. There's, the grants and, and bonds are just so attractive. Well, it also provides a unique estate planning opportunity in that it's one of the few accounts that can receive RSP or RIF money transferred into it without any taxation. Now, the, it'll, it'll pay tax when the money comes out, but the Not reality is, is that yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's better than having it up to, up to half of it disappear if you're at the top marginal rate of death. So that's the RDSP. What else are they entitled to from the government there? If someone is disabled, they can also qualify for the Canada Pension Plan Disability. And there's a, there's a complicated, uh, I wouldn't say it's, it, it's that complicated, but if, if someone qualifies and has cr- contributed to the Canada Pension Plan, and they become disabled, they can also qualify for CPP disability. And that amount is, oh man, it's 75% of what you would qualify for plus, is it 400? It's pretty close to, it's pretty close to the full benefit. I mean, here's, here's the thing though. The exactly. one thing I have to caution, the interesting thing about that though, is you qualify for that. And in order to qualify for that, it's, you have to be basically permanently disabled. It's pretty much the definition, but people can't let this lull themselves into a false sense of security because what happens is, is that when you hit 65, that benefit then changes to the normal CPP you would qualify for. Now that right. could be up to full CPP if you got disabled later on in life, or it can be close to nothing because maybe you got disabled in your first couple of years at work, so you're not entitled to much. So that's that's a challenge. So people have to planning has to be done to basically make sure people understand that. Now you would qualify for old age security at the time, but it doesn't necessarily fully offset the loss of the CPP de- disability benefit. Oh, absolutely not. Old age security is, uh, well, I mean, CPP can be, is a lot, a lot more generous than, than old age security. I mean, but you raise a good point. So once you, once you're on CPP disability, it converts to just regular CPP at age 65. And, and to your point, the way that CPP is calculated, it, your, your benefits could go substantially, could da- go down substantially. So before we get into uh, applying this to uh, different users, like the business owners and whatnot. Let's talk about one last thing, which is planning considerations for estate planning considerations for people around disabilities. So a lot of the programs we discussed are income tested yes. and or asset tested. Yes. And unfortunately, just leaving leaving money directly to a disabled person, assuming that they're they have cognitive capacity to, to handle it, is not the best strategy because you could actually adversely affect the benefits they're entitled to. So can you speak to what goes wrong if basically disabled people get left money directly? Yeah, well, that's a very powerful question because yeah, at the end of the day, if someone receives money directly, 
first of all, they could be disqualified for the ODSB. The main thing that they're probably missing out on is if they do proper planning and a Henson Trust is, is created or, or what, what we would now call a qualified disability trust is, is created in the estate, then the individual has the ability to have that income sheltered and taxed at the most preferential rates. It's actually the only trust account now other than the... Um, well, it, it really is the only trust account now that has any tax benefits left to it. So, if somebody, so let's talk about what that means. So it's a trust that we specifically leave to a disabled person. It qualifies as a special type of trust under the tax code. There's some problems that right. have to happen. But by preferential, what we're talking about is that it pays tax like its own taxpayer. A normal trust, as much as everybody seems to think that trusts are for planning for rich people to avoid taxes, trusts pay tax at the top marginal tax rate. Disability trusts, like Henson's trusts, pay them as if they're taxpayers. So yes, there can be the ability to pay less tax within them. But let's face it, we're talking about supporting someone who's disabled. So if you're going to get your panties in a bunch over that, you're going to have, <laughs> I, I don't know that I want to talk to you about it. Like, but let's make sure we make things easy for people with disabilities as much as possible. Right. But the, the other issue is that if you have a trust, you, you have the control over the over the assets and you have a trustee who will look after the, the account of the person with disability. And, and as we talked about before, disabilities can be, there can be a huge range of disabilities. And if there's if the person has a disability and they don't have the ability to look after money for themselves, it's certainly leaving a trust with someone like a, a trustee who, who is capable and cares for that individual, that is by far the, the best benefit. I do quite honestly believe that the, the tax benefits are, are significant as well, because I've seen, I've seen Henson Trust being created outside the will. And, and unfortunately, they just, you know, they get, uh, they're, they're now at the highest rate. So it, it's unfortunate that that's happened. Yeah, I, I, we, we do. We have come across some pretty poor planning when it comes to disabled people. Like, again, yeah, you set up one of those trusts while you're alive, they won't qualify for the preferential tax treatment. You set it up on your will, and they do. So, one really has to wonder what the person was doing setting it up in the first place. Maybe there's a use case that I'm not aware of, but I've yet to yeah. see one, quite honestly. Okay, so we've kind of gone over all the core, all the key major areas. So, we talked about uh, WSIB, Canada Pension Plan, the Disability Tax Credit, the RDSP estate planning for trust. So let's kind of go through the different user cases again. So we talked about employees. So let's talk about what, what, what employees are entitled to under disability. And this is, of course, let me take a step back. This is even if there is no disability plan in place through their group benefits plan. Now, we talked about group benefits and disability and the importance of that in a previous episode with Keith Foote when we looked at group benefits plans. So if you want more information on that, go back. But even if the employer does not have a group benefits plan in place, what is the employee entitled to? Well, as we mentioned, about everything we just discussed. Right. So outside the WSIB, unless they have a personal plan or the Canada Pension Plan, they really aren't entitled to a whole lot. Yeah. So WSIB, Canada Pension Plan, they would qualify for the tax credit and they would qualify for the use of a, um, what's it called, of the uh, of any kind of trust and the RDSP. But yeah, when you that may sound like a bunch of stuff, but when you really put that together, that's not necessarily going to cover any meaningful amount of your income necessarily, right? No one's going to be in a, in a too good a position for having that situation be the case. Right. So the fact you qualify for, to open an RDSP doesn't mean that you have the income or the assets to contribute to it. Now, that's actually, that raises a good a good point, actually, because the RDSP, yeah. if you do qualify for the RDSP, you don't have to make a contribution. In, in fact, yes, yeah, that's right. People don't realize that. Yeah, so so it, it makes sense to to open an RDSP account whether you have the income to to contribute to it or not because the government will uh, that there are some bonds that you can qualify for. I believe yeah, it's five. so that bond is is basically income tested, not contribution tested. So therefore, if you just open it, you will automatically get free money, quote unquote, free money. So that's the employee. Let's talk about the employer. How does that differ? Are employers covered under w, WSIB? They are not. No. Yeah. So that's the first thing. The other thing yeah. to be aware of, and this is something that comes up a lot, and we talked about this in tax planning um, options, uh, tax planning conversations, is there's a lot of business owners who take dividends instead of of income. How does that affect the other benefits they're entitled to? So that's a very good that's a very good point because oftentimes there's a balance between how much do you pay yourself as a dividend? You know, do you really want to pay yourself a salary so you qualify for CPP? But when you start talking about the disability tax credit and all the other features, then then it it starts to make a lot more sense to actually pay yourself a salary because you pay yourself a salary, you get the disability tax credit as well. You're going to pay very little, very low rates of tax anyway. Plus, you have all the other um, RSP room and, and everything else that you build up. So, the fact that a lot of business owners want to just uh, focus on dividend payment, they may be missing out on some of the other features and benefits that that they would other, otherwise qualify for. So, I would I would suggest that on a case by case basis, you would look at that. But I would 
I would lean towards paying a salary that is optimal. Yeah. So uh, agreed. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, especially people who've been paying CPP for, or sorry, been paying dividends for years and not paying into CPP for God knows how long. What you got to qualify for is substantially lower, unfortunately. So we talked about the employees, employers, like let's talk about employers, family members. What can we do? What can employers do to plan around the disabilities of their family members? So from a regular planning standpoint, if they're not employees and you're just planning for uh, family members, then then you should look at disability, like individual disability plans. Because at the end of the day, if someone is in your family is disabled, quite often the, the situation arises that you're going to be spending a lot of time with them and you're going to be pulled away from your, your company. So it's going to be, a, I don't want to use the word distraction, but it certainly does impact the company. So you do want to have a certain amount of coverage for them uh, so you can get some care and, and that the disruption to the business is, is minimized. So that was a pretty good uh, introduction and coverage of the different programs that exist. The good news is several programs exist. The bad news is you can't just rely on the government. As usual, with all these things, you have to plan for yourself and uh, seek out proper advice on how to basically not only accommodate the disability needs of yourself as a business owner, but also your employees and family members. Guy, thank you very much for taking the time for walking everybody through this. Very much appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. And just where can people find you? They can find me at uh, my, my dealership's Align Capital, my my. My business is Parkview Financial, so they can find me any they can find me on my website there. Excellent. So again, thanks. Thank you for taking the time. Absolutely. Jason. Take care. So that was this week's episode of Financial Planning for Canadian Business Owners. I hope you enjoyed that and I hope you found it informative. Um, we did not get into the very specific final down to the ex- absolute number of details of some of these programs because quite honestly, they change every year. So uh, be be aware that this is something that gets updated frequently, but at least we made you uh, aware of the different things that you and your employees are entitled to. As always, if you enjoyed this podcast, please review on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Until next time, take care. This podcast was brought to you by Woodgate Financial, an award-winning financial planning firm catering to high net worth individuals, business owners, and their families. To learn more, go to woodgate.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, and Spotify, or find more episodes at jasonperera.ca. You can even ask Surrey, Alexa, or Google Home to subscribe for you. 